This program brought to you by ACS. Think ahead, create the future, change the world. This is Swipe on Your Money. Hello, I'm James Daganix and welcome to Swipe, the show designed to keep you up to date with all the latest and greatest trends and products in tech. Coming up... It's one thing about the idea, but whether you've got the perseverance and the drive to actually try and deliver it up. So an idea is not worth anything unless you've got great people. We speak to Afterpay this year's winner of the Deloitte Technology Fast 50 on what the, makes the payments company tick. And the world's gaming community divided after Fortnite Battle Royale took out the award for Ultimate Game of the Year. We'll have that a little bit later on in the show. But first, South Start Conference kicks off tomorrow in Adelaide, celebrating the collision of people, ideas and technology. The feature, the lineup, I should say, features a range of thought leaders from Australia and abroad who are shaping the narrative of the digital um, era. Well, one of those speakers. Lewis Horn, CEO of electric car manufacturer Unity, I'm pleased to say joins us from our Adelaide studio. Um, do appreciate you joining us uh, this evening, Lewis. Just to start with, from what I understand, you're talking about lessons learned from the startup game. Look, you've been doing this a while now across various countries. What are some of the key ones as far as you're concerned, some of the key lessons that maybe you've had to learn? Uh, yeah, well, firstly, thanks for having me on here. Um, this is particularly about lessons learned in the high stakes startup game. Uh, you know, we're developing, bringing to market an autonomous electric car, so this is an extremely challenging project. Um, I'll start off talking a little bit about entrepreneurship theory and how mm. you start in this creative chaos, you know, point of limited means and defining an imagined future uh, and trying to work towards that and then transition to a causation-based sort of linear managerial approach, uh, starting with defined means and a defined goal. Um, but then I'll talk a little bit about you know, some of the, the challenging, some of the adversity, uh, some of the way that uh, you, know, you, you think and operate as an entrepreneur and how mm -hmm. to function better, how to interact with other people, if you think about different thinking styles, um, if you think about how you know, life, uh, life gives us the software and nature gives us our hardware, and how can we uh, create sort of... Um, fix some of the bugs in our software so that we can function better as entrepreneurs in that kind of very high intensity phase. Is it, is it an ongoing learning process when, when you're sort of that, that high stakes entrepreneurial level? And you made mention of the, the ability to interact with, with others because I imagine there are a lot of strong personalities in that sort of environment who are used to backing themselves, you know, not perhaps being quite as collectively minded. Sure. I mean, and, and I would say, I mean, in terms of the learning process, that never ends, right? Mm. Uh, so I, I really went through a, a big learning phase to start this company, but certainly learned the most in the last three years. Honestly, I, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but I'm very glad that I did it. <laughs> but I think the learning phase will continue, and that's a little bit about what this South Start speech is mm. about, because I, I really feel if I had known, you know, three years ago the things I know today, I think... Uh, it, it would have, you know, life would have been a whole lot, whole lot more smooth, I would say. Although then I guess if it's too smooth, you should probably turn up the intensity. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of big personalities. I think uh, even myself can be a really big personality. But one of the key things that you learn is how to be happy and healthy and grateful and composed in a in a state of big personalities. <laughs> How do you bring that to, to, to Unity? And give us a little bit of a background about it. it it's a, a startup in Sweden that is essentially designing electric cars, but for a, a global market. I mean, if you wanted to pick a difficult market, you've, you've certainly done well. I, I, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the kind of challenge that really attracts me as an entrepreneur and what I really designed my life for. Um, so yeah, it's, an, it's a Swedish-based company. I'm Australian originally, mm. although you probably can't tell from my uh, <laughs> accent. But uh, yeah, it's been an incredible journey. Where's the, I mean, if we start looking at, at the industry more broadly, I know you've, you've spoken quite a bit about the future of cars and uh, transport. Where's it going? I mean, where are we actually headed? How are we going to be commuting, if you like, into the future? I mean, there's a lot of claims being made about mm. sort of level five autonomy and when that's going to happen. I think it's very important to make such claims and set the bar really high right now. 
but realistically I don't think you're going to see like level five autonomy functioning well in society within the next decade. I think it's going to take at least a decade. Certainly we can do little tricks and in our car it'll, it'll do a couple of tricks. I mean there's so much value we can add in the short term in terms of parking and all this kind of stuff. But the day where you know we have robots driving everybody around, it's we still a ways to go there. But certainly uh, we're heading towards a shared mobility model, mobility as a service model. So we as a company, we do direct sales, B2B and B2C, but this is really about getting production volumes up and getting the cost of production and the bill of materials down. Uh, ultimately, within a decade, we don't want to sell any cars at all. People should be able to just subscribe or pay per use. I mean, ultimately, one of the challenges we're trying to solve is the fact that cars are parked for 96% of their mm -hmm. lives. Uh, this is an incredible you know, burden, capital burden on families. Uh, it's a, obviously a terrible burden on the environment uh, and in the traffic in our cities. So definitely we're going towards a, a much more asset lean. But we're going towards a more asset lean future anyway. But a car is one of the worst assets you can have, perhaps aside from a yacht or something like that. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> Do you get the sense that society uh, is is up for that. I mean, a lot of people love their cars. Now, now be it they autonomous in decades to come, as opposed to just you know sharing cars. Do you think that there is the demand there, and is it something that is being led from the a, a younger generation? I, I think certainly, obviously, later generations will you know definitely not understand why they should own such a big heavy oversized piece of machinery but for the current generation of course there's a, you know there's a ways to go uh, our approach as a company is really to get rid of that second family car that old mm. beater that's pumping gas out into the city but for the moment the first family car you know the, the big SUV that's still a reflection of the identity of your family so it's a ways before we get away from that and, and maybe that'll be be around for a long time I don't know but it's that second family car, the mm -hmm. daily commuter that you're actually driving through the city all the time. That's what we want to address and, and get rid of that. Want to replace it with something that's lightweight, energy efficient, cost effective, uh, and has a great user experience. Makes a lot of sense. Lewis, we've got to leave it there. Do appreciate you joining us this evening. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks very much for having me on here. Well, Afterpay has taken out Deloitte's technology Fast 50 with a phenomenal 8,134% growth over a three-year period. The awards recognise the fastest growing technology companies in Australia with awards for leadership and rising stars. I spoke to Afterpay Group head David Hancock on the company's success. Um, David Hancock, firstly, congratulations. Big, big win for Afterpay this evening. What are you thinking when they, when they read out the Afterpay name? Oh, incredibly humbling. So, I mean, when you see these amazing tech companies that are coming up, the first thing that hits me is, is that, wow, isn't this amazing to be with a bunch of really amazing talent? Um, just on that then, what do you think of the level of talent coming up, not just in something like the Delo Deloitte um, Fast 50, but more broadly, the people that you're speaking to, you're seeing, what do you make of it? Yeah, listen, every day we just see some of the most amazing people that want to come and work with us or want to come and partner with us, whether it be in retail. I think what's really happening is with a lot of the changes in education, what we're starting to see is it's starting to really filter through that actually being an entrepreneur, actually running your own business and really doing things that are really exciting, that's some of the things that we're seeing every day. So for us at Afterpay, it's just very, very encouraging to see great talent and great business come through. Can I ask, from your perspective, what makes a good idea? You know, when I imagine you've heard plenty of ideas, yeah. you know, over your career, what, make, what makes a good idea? Well, listen, when Nick came to me and Anthony, the two co-founders, and they had this idea about how to actually turn credit on its head by making a really simple idea, you know what, the thing that really hit me was the passion by which the idea gets delivered. So it's not the idea, it's actually the people who come up and want to have the drive, because actually to do this or what these other companies are doing, it's one thing about the idea, but whether you've got the perseverance and the drive to actually try and deliver it up. So an idea is not worth anything unless you've got great people.
is it hard? Is it is is it one thing, as you say, having a good idea, but actually getting success or getting to some yeah. sort of stage of success? Is that just hard work? Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I think everyone at Afterpay Touch, what we'd recognise is we've never worked harder. But the thing that co that really drives us is is that when you really concentrate about what your purpose is. So having that core purpose around doing the right thing by customers and really, really doing that actually makes all of that hard work worthwhile. What is the purpose? What is the mission? Yeah. When you guys sit down each day, you're looking yeah. at the business, looking at, and we'll talk about other markets, yeah. but what is the, the purpose from your perspective when it comes to Afterpay Touch? Yeah, it's really simple. We want to be the world's most loved way to pay. No, it might be simple, but ambitious. Yeah, but it's based on a very simple idea, which is how can we actually deliver up a free service to our customers and change the economics of how people pay? Do you think it surprised many in, in that, it, you know, existing people within that, that payment space? Because it, it seems like a simple idea, as you say, but no one else has been doing it. Yeah, I think that what we've actually tried to do is we've really embraced that idea that actually trust your customers. Many financial services are actually built on that whole comprehension, that whole idea that you actually mistrust customers. We actually build everything about on the idea that we trust our customers and they trust us. And when you get that, you get this amazing engagement. So we've been very pleased to see that, you know, recently Roy Morgan came out with their um, trust survey. Um, the banks were at a very low level, probably negative trust engagement. PayPal is sitting about 38 and Afterpay was sitting at a 60 index. And for us, that's a demonstration that trust will be rewarded back to you. And is that something that extend, I imagine extends beyond the uh, domestic ambitions? Because Afterpay, obviously, looking beyond these shores, early stages, but how important is that when you're thinking about coming up with a good idea, the idea of the scalability beyond geographical borders? Well, listen, Nick Molnar, our co-founder, he's over in the States at the moment. We've got about 70 amazing people over there now, and that's all been driven off the back of actually merchants wanting us to go to the States with them. This this isn't us about finding an atlas and saying the US looks like a great market. This is absolutely working in lockstep with our great merchants. So people like Urban Outfitters, Anthropology, Cotton On, all these amazing merchants, what they want to do is they want to deliver this service up for their customers through Afterpay. Got to ask, uh, thoughts on, on the Senate ASIC inquiry, um, yeah. your, you know, your thoughts on the looking at this, this, um, lend, this day lending, payday lending yeah. space? Listen, you know, when the um, inquiry was launched a couple of weeks ago, we absolutely welcome that because what we absolutely believe in is that whole idea about having strong regulation um, in order to enable what we do and in order to make sure that consumers are absolutely protected. What we're very um, proud about what we've done today is we've got great hardship policies. We've got, you know, for us, we don't allow everyone to use Afterpay, but what we want to make sure is there's a strong regulatory framework that's appropriate, that enables the types of companies that we are to deliver up services. So we're very supportive, but we want to make sure that it's the appropriate regulation that helps you know, customers and merchants grow. Because that was one of the issues for the broader space, the idea that, you know, uh, the checks and balances on those people who are being able to use, yeah. the, use the actual services and their ability, should they fall behind, to actually keep their head above water. Yeah, so one of the unique things about Afterpay is, you know, which, which is totally different from traditional credit, we do not allow a customer to kick the can down the road. So you can't pay a fee like a credit card and keep on using the service if you can't afford to pay it. If you cannot pay your instalment, you are locked out of the system. We reject up to 50% of all brand new orders into Afterpay. Afterpay is very much a free service for customers that can enter into you know, the arrangements that we put in place. So we absolutely want to make sure that the environment is absolutely set up so companies entering this space don't go through shortcuts. David Hancock, once again, congratulations. It's been a hell of a rise of Afterpay and some pretty special recognition tonight. Thank you so much. Cheers back we'll speak to one of the world's leading developers of trading data for machine learning and artificial intelligence and now more swipe on your money 
Welcome back. Australian tech stocks in the red once again today after a volatile past few months. The US fangs on the verge of a bear market. So should you be worried about the sector's volatility and for the tech startups out there, will your ideas cut through the noise? Well, I spoke to APID CEO Mark Bryan at Deloitte's Tech Fast 15 Sydney last week for his take on the sector. Mark Bryant, really appreciate you joining us this evening. Beautiful Sydney uh, Harbour, can't get much better than this. And big, big event. Why are events like this, the Deloitte Fast 50, so important? So it's interesting, James, because I, I spoke tonight and um, one of the things I said is that you have to play a really long game. And, and it's hard to play a long game. And you need encouragement along the way. So that's why I think these events are important because they, they, they help you, they reward you, they nourish you. And um, I, I think that's an important part of the equation. So Deloitte's done a terrific job and, and I love being here. When you say that you have to play a long game, do you think that surprises some people? Is there a view that you know, there's a degree of instant success when you're going down the entrepreneurial route, you're going down the startup route? I don't think there's any degree of solid instant success. I think we all enjoy um, sugar hits, if you will, but uh, to build a, a good business that's going to last a long time and pro provide a lot of value for, for your customers, for your staff, for your investors, it, it takes a long time. Let's talk Appen. Big, big announcement today. Congratulations. Um, the growth, w what are you seeing? What's driving that growth? We're hooked into a great thematic. Um, uh, AI is is um, part of the future, uh, and and I honestly believe AI will do a lot of good. I think in the wrong hands, of course, it can do the wrong things, but in the right hands, I think it will do a lot of good. And AI relies on data. The data teaches the AI. The expression machine learning is part of that. Um, it's a technique that requires data to learn, and we deliver that data. So so yeah, we're very bullish on the long term. Um, it was interesting. I was talking to the um, chief technology officer for Microsoft, and he suggested that in the future, every company is going to be an AI company. Every company is going to be a, a, a data company. I mean, is that how you view the, the future in terms of business and AI? I take a slightly different um, but consistent view, and that is that, um, so, so with machine learning, you, you get some data, the algorithm creates the software. So I think software de development will be largely AI or largely machine learning driven. Um, currently there are many development techniques, but in the future I think 80 plus percent of software will, will be driven by machine learning. Uh, so to that ex if that means that every company is AI led, yes, I agree. But I think if you break it down, there's many businesses that rely on other things, the interface with people, physical assets, etc. But I think that a lot of technology and a lot of software development will rely on machine learning and in that AI bracket, yes, that's true. Is it interesting, we're talking about the, the human element as well as the, you know, the sort of AI machine learning element. Appen itself is a fascinating sort of combination of the two. Uh, the crowd that, that you source, just for those unaware, just explain what is a rather unique model that Appen has. Yeah, so this is, uh, this catches a lot of people off guard. So there's, um, AI relies on machine learning, which relies on data. Uh, there are, uh, broadly, in the world of machine learning, two sets of data. There are structured data that come out of corporate systems and the like. And then there's unstructured data, which is typically things that are human-like, pictures and, and speech and, and complex decisions. That unstructured data requires someone to add some structure to it, and that's what we do. So we can collect vast amounts of speech data, thousands of hours of speech data, and add some structure to it, which simply is, a, a you know, in some cases, a transcription that the computer can read and build patterns between that and the sounds. Or another example is uh, with image or video data. The computer has no idea what the image is, has got in it. So if a human can uh, circle various features or describe it in a way, then the computer can link that picture with that description and start to find some patterns. And in the future, uh, build some predictions about what a particular uh, picture is. 
And the way we do it is with people. So we use vast crowds of people. We have over a million uh, people in our database. We're paying maybe 40,000 uh, people every month to do data annotation for us. And those people are in 130 countries around the world. Which brings another interesting point into uh, the discussion that a lot of people say, well, AI is going to take jobs. Well, we've just created 40,000 jobs. And in some cases, jobs for people that can't get other work. They may be stay-at-home parents. They may uh, be disabled in some way. And so they're at home working on their computers, doing something that is frankly very futuristic and very valuable. I've got to ask you about the current, uh, the current climate at the moment, as far as markets are concerned. And, and, um, and a lot of the so-called, well, they're now called, I don't know if you know it, they're called wax stocks. And Appen is very much a part of that. Your thoughts on the market's understanding of high growth, tech sort of growth stocks, and, and what we're seeing at the moment as far as the, I suppose, the, the, the volatility. So I, I think that the markets uh, in Australia understand the growth dynamics of tech stocks. There is a negligible difference in the valuations between uh, tech stocks in Australia and tech stocks overseas. Uh, so I think the market here understands that. Um, you know, maybe we, uh, we benefit from some scarcity value uh, versus the US, but generally the market understands how to value tech stocks. I think the volatility we're seeing at the moment is, is understandable uh, due to macro factors well beyond uh, the tech realm. And um, I, again, we play a long game. Uh, we're, we're quite confident that what we do is, is, uh, is very solid uh, for the future. So, you know, the current volatility doesn't trouble us. Mark Bryan, really appreciate you joining us this evening. Thank you. Thanks, James. Coming up after the break, we speak to a gaming expert on Fortnite's latest success and why it's stirring up so much controversy. We'll be back with more Swipe on Your Money. And now, more Swipe on Your Money. Welcome back. Well, Fortnite's Battle Royale has taken out the biggest gaming award of 2018, beating out the likes of Favourites God of War, Red Dead Redemption 2 and Spider-Man. The coveted title has divided gamers right around the world on social media. Well, we spoke to News Corp journalist Wilson Smith to find out why. Wilson Smith, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, no worries. A little bit controversial. Fortnite taking out the top gong at the Joystick Awards. Um, your thoughts on, on why it's been a bit of a, a divisive win? Well, I think it's uh, gotten a lot of votes purely just on how popular it is. Uh, I don't think it's actually... Uh, this is coming from someone who plays quite often. Mm. It's, a, you know, it's a really enjoyable game, but I just don't think it's really in the same class as some of the other games that were nominated. Why? Like why? What, what, what sort of has detracted from it in terms of some of the other peer games? Well, it's a fun game, but I just don't think you can class it in the same tier. It's just not quite as serious as some of the other games. You know, uh, something like God of War, which was probably one of the best games of the year, undisputedly. Uh, you know, not just in terms of the graphics, but also the story and the cinematography and a bunch of other factors. Whereas Fortnite is essentially just a multiplayer game with no story. It's sort of like giving uh, a kid's movie the best uh, Oscar award. And yet it is so popular. Why? Like if, it, if, it's, if it, it doesn't have that sort of cinematography, it doesn't have the, the plot lines, why is it so damn popular? Oh, I think with some people uh, who prefer sort of like in-depth games, you know, they'll enjoy those sorts of things. But other people prefer games that are just simple and easy to play that aren't so complicated. And so for things like multiplayer games, uh, Fortnite's really, really good. But yeah. when you're comparing it to the, the best games of the year, you know, it's sort of not even in the same class. Battle Royale mode is something that people have mentioned is, is one of the, the, the key elements, if you like, to success of Fortnite, but other sort of iterations that have it. I mean, is this is a relatively new phenomenon, the idea of just all in, go for it. Uh, it is fairly new, uh, but... Fortnite has sort of broken this ground that no, other people, uh, other games that have been doing uh, battle royale formats haven't really seemed to be able to replicate. You know, uh, the new Call of Duty game yeah. uh, pretty much abandoned mm. all uh, all uh, uh, plot to introduce this uh, battle royale mode, and I've played it as well, and it it's pretty good, but it just doesn't really compare to sort of Fortnite. 
Uh, so Fortnite's just setting setting all these records that no one can break. What should have won? What do you think is was the best video game of the year? Uh, I think God of War was a, a clear favourite. Uh, but, you know, even the recent Red Dead Redemption 2 is really mm. good. The Amazing Spider-Man was uh, a really awesome, uh, another a really good plot-driven game. And it just has... The, the, these are all titles that have something that Fortnite just can't offer. Has it been a particularly good year? I mean, are, you, are we constantly seeing the bar raised? Yeah, you know, just when you think you've played what might be one of the best games of all time, another one comes along and just sort of knocks your socks off. You know, <laughs> God of War was really amazing this year and then Spider-Man comes along, which was awesome, and I've just finished Red Dead Redemption 2 last night and it probably has one of the most incredible finishes of a game I've ever played. What do you look for? I mean, what is it that, that when you're playing a game and you're just looking at a game that, that you're looking for to sort of judge it on as far as quality is concerned? Well, I think we're sort of getting into a time where games are increasingly sort of blurring the lines and are almost like sort of movies mm. nowadays. So I think when I'm playing a game, I'm really looking for something that, that just has a, a really engaging story, something you can really get immersed in. And, you know, sometimes you just want to lay back and play something easy when Fortnite's good, but other times you really just want to get involved in something. Does Fortnite have legs? I mean, do you, do you see it being around for years to come or is it, is it do you think, going to be susceptible to, to challenges in the, in the years to come? Yeah, I think it will definitely uh, there will be ebbs and flows and sort of as each new season of Fortnite ends, you can mm. sort of fit, get this feeling that it's sort of losing some traction and then just as as you start to feel that a new season comes along and and you've forgotten all about it and it seems like it just won't come to an end but how long can it actually last for who knows so final question um given you know one last opportunity to play a game you won't wouldn't be allowed to play a video game after it what would you choose to play Oh, you put me in bizarre a bizarre question, you, but I'm no, interested to know the answer. That's uh, you probably you put me in a difficult spot here, but I think I'm gonna have to go with uh, Halo Two. Yeah. Uh, I just had a lot of fun playing that growing up, and I think it's something I could, if I had to go out with a bang, <laughs> that that might be it. Wilson Smith, do appreciate you joining us today. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. We ask all the hard questions here on Swipe. That is the program for this week. I'm James Dagonixon. Have a good night. This program brought to you by ACS. Think ahead. Create the future. Change the world.